Welcome to the session of the day. We begin with the introduction to world theatre wherein we will first look into the French theatre. The French renaissance took place between the 1500s and 1700s as in rest of Europe. In the early years of renaissance, public theatre remained closely associated with the long medieval heritage of mystery plays, morality plays and farces in France. Renaissance was considered to have arrived late in France than the rest of Europe because of this lingering influence of medieval drama. Thus, early French drama was barely noteworthy in the world of theatre. Dramatists mostly catered to the aristocracy and hardly produced any plays of lasting interest. This situation started changing around the end of 16th century when skilled companies and playwrights began to appear in Paris leading to the arrival of renaissance theatre in France. Let us now examine the historical context and the theatre. Public performances of plays were under the constant scrutiny of the church. The performances took place under a rigid guild system, the guild Les Confrères de la Passion, an association of Paris merchants and tradesmen formed in 1402 to produce religious plays held rights to theatrical productions of the mystery plays in Paris. However, in 1548, the pa Paris Parliament prohibited performances of the mysteries in the capital for fear of violence or blasphemy. The Infant Saint Souci and Clerics de la Besoc were guilds in charge of farces and scotties. The Infant Saint Souci was one of the largest of societies Jusé of medieval France, an association of merchants, craftsmen and the students of Paris, founded for the purpose of staging theatrical entertainments and other amusements. Such societies are thought to be descended from the earlier Feast of Fools, a holiday of the lower clergy that was suppressed in the late Middle Ages. The Cleric de la Besoch, a community of law clerks of the lawyers, prosecutors and advisors of the Parliament of Paris, whose judicial and theatrical practices were interlinked and transmitted within their professional community, they considered themselves to be the guardians of a cultural heritage and of the world of justice. The farce and stupidity played by the clerks of justice reveal a specifically Basque culture wherein the carnivalesque spirit flourishes and where political satire is important, where there is a strong corporate spirit, a pronounced inclination for intellectual reasoning, an anti-clerical stance and a manifest materialism. Both Enfant Saint Sushi and Clerics de la Besoche came under political scrutiny and were suppressed by 1582. By the end of the 16th century, only the Confrère de la Passion remained with exclusive rights over public theatrical productions in Paris and they rented out their theatre at Hotel de Bourgogne to theatrical troops for a high price. The Hotel de Bourgogne was Paris's first public theatre. In 1634, the Théâtre de Marais was built by converting a tennis court. Louis XIV merged Paris's two leading theatre companies in 1680 to form the Comédie Française, Europe's first national theatre. The theatre had an auditorium with a pit where the spectators stood, two levels of boxes and a steep tire of benches at the back for seating. Paris public theatres were rectangular, long and narrow with its typical auditorium and capabilities for sophisticated effects. Early on, scenic practice mimicked the conventions of medieval drama until Italian scene designs were adopted. 
theater evolved further in the Baroque era and staging became highly sophisticated with the innovations in actual architectural space. The stage could change from a romantic garden to the interior of a palace in a matter of seconds. The entire space became a framed selected area that only allowed the users to see a specific action hiding all the machinery and technology employed, which were mainly ropes and pulleys. Let us now look into the influences and forms. We shall begin with the Commedia dell'Art in France. Other than mystery plays and morality plays, farce was a well known genre in France even before the dawn of the Renaissance. Le Gacon et Evougle, a tale of a young boy who tricks his master out for a large sum of money, was written in the 13th century. It must be because of this traditional affinity towards farce that the church allowed Commedia dell'Art troops that travelled from Italy to France, though it strictly clamped down on performances that clashed with its world view. They were invented to France from 1576 onwards and were gradually popular among the French audience. The stock characters from the Commedia dell'Art had a profound effect on French theatre and their lasting influence is discernible in the braggarts, fools, lovers and old men that populate French theatre. We move on to a discussion of Baroque. Baroque theatre is a term which describes the period between the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe when theatre became an extravagant enterprise. This form of theatre lacked the elements and direction typically associated with neoclassicism and the era of enlightenment. Themes of plays became less focused on religion and more focused on the interactions or discoveries of humanity. The Baroque style of theatre was unusual for the time often lively and considered vulgar due to gaudy costume designs, elaborate stage settings and special effects. The era produced some of the world's most respected playwrights and proved to be the basis for modern theatre. Moliere was one of the famous French playwrights who was influenced by both Commedia dell'Art and Baroque theatre. Let us now move on to a discussion of neoclassicism. With the arrival in the French court of eminent figures such as Catherine de Medici and Hippolito de Estate, France was exposed to neoclassical drama which had started to be produced by Italian humanists during the last years of the 15th century. As early as 1503, original language versions of the plays of the masters of antiquity such as Sophocles, Seneca, Euripides, Aristophanes, Terence and Plautus were all available in Europe. In the 1540s, the French university setting turned host to a neo-Latin theatre. In 1554, the Queen Catherine de Medici commissioned a translation of Giangio Trisono's La Sophonisba, which was to be the first humanist tragedy to appear in the French language. The play turned out to be a grand success and many playwrights sought to imitate its style in their writing. We shall now move on to humanist tragedy. With the arrival of neoclassicism from Italy, humanist theatres started appearing in France from the 1550s. The tragedies showed influence of Seneca in their attention to lyrical passages and rhetorical style. Plots were taken from the Bible or ancient mythology and history or even from contemporary political events. All these plots tried to parallel political and religious issues 
being played out or being discussed in France at the time. French humanist writers adhering to the neoclassical spirit recommended that tragedy should be in five acts and have three main characters of noble rank. The play should begin in the middle of the action which is known as in medias res, use noble language and not show scenes of horror on the stage. Etienne Jodel's Cleopatra captive in 1553 which dramatized the fears and doubts of Cleopatra contemplating suicide is a first original French play to follow Horace's classical structure of the play with five acts, the unities of time, place and action well in place and the use of classical chorus that comments on the action and speaks directly to the characters. Melin G. St. Gilles translation of Gian Giorgio Trissino's La Sophonis Bay in 1556 was the first modern regular tragedy based on ancient models. Theodore D. Bezet, Jacques Grevin, Robert Garnier and Nicolas de Montre are some other notable writers of French humanist tragedies. We shall now have a discussion of comedy. Queen Catherine also sponsored the first neoclassical comedy pop popularly known as Commedia Erudita in France called La Calandra penned by Cardinal Bibiana. Following the neoclassical rules, comedies of the time sought to correct vice by showing the truth and have happy endings. They used a lower style of language than tragedy. As comedies were not expected to paint the great events of states and leaders, but the private lives of people with love as its principal subject. French Renaissance comedy borrowed from their medieval farces and Italian humanist comedies. Etienne Jodel, Jacques Grevin, Jean Anthony de Beif, Puri de Larue were the noteworthy comedy writers of 16th century. Let us now analyze what tragic comedy has to do. In the last decade of the 16th century, there were experiments that moved away from the rigid rules of the classical theatre. The most famous of the French tragic comedies of the time is Robert Garnier's Bradamante, written in 1580, that was adapted from Ariosto's Orlando Furioso. Let us now have a look into the 17th century French theatre. As discussed in the earlier sections, public theatrical productions in Paris were under the control of guilds. In 1599, the guild Les Confrances de la Passion, with exclusive rights to oversee all theatrical productions in the capital, abandoned its privilege, which permitted other theatres and theatrical companies to operate in the capital. In the 17th century, the French theatre reached its pinnacle. The theatre performances took place twice a week and it often encompassed several works. They began with a comic prologue, then a tragedy or tragic comedy, followed by a farce and finally a song. Theatre at the beginning of the 17th century was dominated by the genres and dramatists of the previous generation, especially Robert Garnier. The royal court had by then started preferring tragic comedy over tragedy, but the theatre going public still preferred tragedy. In the 1630s, influenced by Baroque novels, the public interest shifted towards tragic comedy to make it the most 
most dominant theatre genre in France. This new trend was broken by the immense success of Corneille's Les Cid in 1637 and Horace in 1640. Thus, tragic comedy enjoyed a brief period of popularity, but it was tragedy that was a dominant genre of the most fruitful period of French Renaissance theatre. Important models for the 17th century's comedy, tragedy and tragic comedy were also supplied by the Spanish playwrights Pedro Calderon de la Baca, Tirso de Molina and Lope de Vega, many of whose works were translated and adapted for the French stage. Italy was also a source of model for stage, theory and decorum. Let us now look into the important playwrights of the 17th century France. This period was famous for its three greatest playwrights, Pierre Corniel, Molière and Jean Racine. Let us look into the contribution of Pierre Corniel. Pierre Corniel was born in 1606 and began writing plays in the 1620s. His first play was a comedy called Melite. He was admitted to the Academia Francaise in 1647 under the patronage of the powerful Cardinal Riclieu, though he had written comedies, tragedies and tragic comedies, he is remembered as the tragedian who produced the most important landmark in the history of French drama, Les Cid. This play is about a 12th century Spanish hero, Corniel, conscious of the classic bent associated with the French taste, adhered to the neoclassical ideal, yet fashioned it to produce a tragedy which was rich in passion, poetic fervour and vigour and appealed well to Gallic sensibilities. The play is considered a balance between the romantic and classical schools. Nevertheless, he had to face harsh criticism from the Académie Française for breaching the unities in the play. Corniel continued to produce plays until 1674 and also wrote a discourse about dramatic poetry. The most unique aspect of Pierre Corniel's plays is the basic psychology of his characters. The heroes of his tragedies are involved in political dilemmas and the problems often get enmeshed in family conflicts and relations. His characters have a desire for distinction, to be exceptional and this intense desire often is a driving force behind their acts of courage and brutality. This type of hero came to be known as a Cornelian hero. His theory was that the subject of tragedy should be remote and improbable with as many striking and extraordinary situations as were compatible with the unity of action. Melite, Ritandre, Lavo, La Galerie du Palais, La Suante, La Palace Royale and Les Illusion Comic are Corniel's comedies and tragic comedies. Les Cid, Horace, Cinna and Polycute are the four plays which are considered his greatest achievements as a writer. He was tremendously popular in France and his popularity was eclipsed only by the arrival of Jean Racine and Molière. Let us now look into the contribution of Jean Racine to the French theatre. Jean Racine was born in 1639 in the Valois region of France. His career as a playwright was initially met with disappointments. Through the various contacts he eventually met with Molière 
who took a chance on him and produced his play La Thibade in 1664. But it was not very well received by the public, the court and the critics. His first rousing success came in 1667 with Andrew Mack, a pastoral drama. Andrew Mack won over both the public and the court and earned Racine a fame comparable to Corniel's Lacid. In 1670, Racine and Corniel both worked on plays constructed around the character Titus. Racine's play Berenice was considered superior to that of Corniel's and from then on he enjoyed a status higher than Corniel in French theatre. Corniel's characters are moral giants endowed with indomitable will. Racine's are intensely human. Jean de la Bruyere, a French philosopher and critic, has pointed out that Corniel painted human beings as they ought to be, whereas Racine painted them as they are. His characters represent the limitations of human beings as the lesson of the tragedy through their sense of loss and their incompleteness. One of Racine's greatest accomplishments was his use of Alexandrin, which is a line of poetic meter comprising of 12 syllables. This gave his plays harmony and elegance in their language. Racine died from liver cancer in 1699. His famous plays are Bajaze, Mithridate, Ephigene, Phaedre, Esther and Athali. Let us now move on to Moliere. Moliere was born on January 15, 1622 in Paris under the name of Jean Baptiste Poquelin. After completing his education from the Jesuit college D. Clement, he joined his family's business. In 1643, he abandoned this and began the Illustre Theatre with Madeleine Bajat and eight other actors. He changed his name to Moliere to save his family from the embarrassment as theatre was not considered an acceptable career option for him. Moliere's illustre theatre was not initially successful in Paris, because of which they had to tour the provinces of France in the next 12 years. They performed tragedies, comedies and also comedia del art routines. In 1658, after the troupe returned to Paris, they performed Le Docteur Amore for King Louis XIV's court. He was able to win the favour of the king who supported him through the rest of his career. He composed 12 of the most durable and penetratingly satirical full-length comedies of all time, some in rhyming verse, some in prose, as well as six shorter farces and comedies. In a period that preferred tragedy as the highest art, Moliere affirmed the potency of comedy as a serious, flexible art form. Many of Moliere's plays combined multiple elements of theatre. He performed farce that was written in verse and often combined music, dance and text into unique forms of performance. He was also credited with giving France the comedy of manners and comedy of character in their modern form. The strongest influence on Moliere's theatre came from the Italian Commedia dell'Art troops with their stock characters and situations. In his longer comedies, Moliere immensely refined the Commedia themes and techniques, setting most of his plots in and around Paris and raising neoclassical French comedy to a plane of artistry and intense inventiveness never attained before or since. He applied the Alexandrian lines, borrowed from contemporary tragedies, 
to a relaxed dialogue that imitated conversational speech. Through his comedies, he commented on the contemporary political situations of his time. Moliere used his plays as public mirrors and attempted to use natural movement, gestures and diction, moving away from the exaggeration of Baroque style. The School for Husbands, The School for Wives, Tartuffe, Don Juan, The Misanthrope, The Doctor in Spite of Himself, Amphitryon, The Miser, George Dandin, The Bourgeois Gentleman, The Learned Ladies and The Imaginary Invalid are some of his famous plays. While performing his play, Le Malade Imaginaire in 1673, Moliere collapsed and passed away at home the same evening. By the end of the 17th century, French Renaissance period waned. Let us now summarize the session. Renaissance French theatre came into being between the 1500s and 1700s. The medieval theatre heritage slowly made way for new innovations as the influence of Italian Renaissance reached France. Theatre was under the rigid scrutiny of the church in the 16th century, but by the end of the century, the first public theatre of France, Hotel de Borgogon, was set up and by 1680, Europe's first national theatre, Comédie Francaise, appeared in Paris. Theatre and staging used Baroque style. In conventions and scene design, French theatres mimicked the Italians. French theatre was influenced by neoclassicism, Baroque and Italian Commedia dell'arte, humanist tragedies, comedies and Tragic comedies were the most important genres of the period. In the 17th century, with the felicitous presence of three greatest playwrights of France, Renaissance theatre peaked in popularity, quality and productivity. Pierre Corneille produced some of the best tragedies of the time, rich with characterization and strong theme, primarily Les Cid and Horace, being the most prominent among them. Jean Racine was another prolific writer who enriched the French theatre with his plays. He was often compared to Corneille, who was believed to be his rival. Racine's characters were much more human in comparison to the idealistic portrayal that Corneille thrived on. Moliere was perhaps the most famous of all the three 17th century playwrights. He was known for his comedies and the innovations he brought to performance. Before we move on to the next session, please try to answer the following questions. The questions are, examine the humanist elements in the works of any one of the French tragedians. The second question is, write a note on the contributions of Pierre Corneille, Molière and Jean Racine to French theatre. Let us look at the books that are recommended for you. The Making of Theatre History by Paul Curitz, Frentice Hall, New Jersey. French Theatre in the Neoclassical Era by William Howarth, published by Cambridge University Press, Cambridge. Thank you for watching this session and I hope the content that was delivered to you would have enriched your idea and knowledge of the French theatre. Thank you.